Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of a Comedy Advice Podcast. My name is Stefan, and I'm your host. Joining me today is an incredibly special guest. He's an actor, writer, and comedian seen on National Lampoon, Comedy Central, Jewish Life TV, and more. He's a regular at the Comedy Store and Hollywood Improv and is open for the greats like Polly Shore and Bobby Lee. He's got a new special out, Daddy Boy. Everybody, please welcome Sandy Danto. Thank you. You know, I hear the raucous applause in my head. Is it really going on in reality? That my stomach is a little grumbly. I've got a grumbly tummy, but it's all it's because when I say Sandy Danto, it grumbles. So I think it's reactionary too. <laughs> That's a normal sure. response to my name. <laughs> oh good. Since I was a little kid. I can't wait what happens at the end of the podcast. But Sandy, <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. First off, how have you been doing? I know we've been going through a little thing called Corona. Um, how, is, how has life been? How has comedy been? It seems like it's in a little bit of a, a rut. Comedy is in bumper to bumper traffic right now. Hmm. But you know, it's, it's still moseying along. Um, I have not, I've been writing. I have not been performing. I have a new album out. I, um, I, you know, I would love to be performing. I miss it. And uh, it's, it's painful to write jokes, to have no one to tell them to, aside from my wife who's over it, and my daughter who doesn't understand it. But um, comedy's good, man. Like right now, the month of October, Leading into November, I got a new album out. I'm going to be on a TV show on the prestigious and ubiquitous Jewish Life TV. Not bragging. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know if anyone's ever bragged about being on Jewish Life TV. Anyway, um, uh, I'm very ever so lightly in the Comedy Store documentary on Showtime. And... Um, I got a new movie out called Tar. So things for me in comedy are good. Oh, and I'm in a new Shutterfly commercial. So, I mean, it's not like, um, you know, the entertainment industry went away. It's just like stand-up is being held hostage. That's true. I, I really like that comedy's in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic analogy because I feel it's kind of, it's late, it's pissed off, everyone is pissed off waiting for it and they don't know what to do. So they're just kind of standing around like, should we do something here? And it, it's quite frustrating. So I kind of exactly. like Exactly. You get it. I, I get it. I get it. Very articulate response. I, I also, uh, first off, before we get into anything, I want to say how good your voice is. I oh, first thank you. I first heard it on the album as I was listening, Daddy Boy. It's a link is in the show notes, listeners, so you can click on that if you want to listen to it. You can listen to it right now and then come back to this. This is like a nice dessert for the album. But I wanted to say first off, the voice is great. I feel like if you are not in the works already in doing like a, a John H. Benjamin piece your voice is so much it reminds me a little bit of his not in it has the same timber but it's just it's, it stands out so much and i can't help but be captivated by your steamy and delicious jokes as you're telling Thank them you. because of the voice yes. thank you i appreciate you saying that i have been for the duration of the pandemic taking zoom voiceover classes shout out to malik Berger. Um, Malik. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I have pivoted to focusing more on trying to sell my voice alone just because, you know, there's just a lot bigger of a market out there for that right now with more animated shows being produced and more voiceover commercials over stock footage of blue collar workers getting up at the crack of dawn to deliver people the, their precious Amazon packages during the pandemic with like very uh, sentimental, like we've, we've isolated. 
we've waited. And now Amazon is here for you with your footstools and your emergency packets because Amazon definitely became trillionaires off the backs of millions of people dying from this virus. Amazon, <laughs> we're gonna charge you $200 a year to have better shipping. Like, I, oh God, you, just saying your name gave me the tinglys in the tummy, but then my whole body just got little goose pimples from that voice. It got, you know what, if that's where we're at five minutes in, I don't wanna know what's gonna get engorged by the end of this conversation. <laughs> That, that's why we do top only for the Zoom. Okay, meetings. cool, that's cool. We do. cool. But anyway, no I, wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to dive into the special daddy boy. I know you've been doing comedy for 14 years plus. This is the debut album. What came into the culmination of you saying, you know what, this is the right time. And then how many years did you go back to compile this? Or was this like fresh off the top, creme de la creme jokes or or how, how did it all happen how did this magic happen <laughs> a magician never reveals its secrets <laughs> all right thank you everybody that's the end of the podcast that's the podcast um so um about eight years ago i wanted to record an album but i'm not the most proactive when it comes to execution mm -hmm. i've recorded i've always recorded myself listen back to my sets and I thought like eight years ago I was ready to and and I was then I was what like six years in or something and I was like I'm ready and I think I was but I just dragged my feet on it dragged my feet on it and then about three years ago this record label 800 pound gorilla um approached me shout out to Neil Weisel and Anthony Leo who are my points of contact there Neil actually used to live in LA and hang out at the comedy store. He was roommates with a former roommate of mine and the former manager of the comedy store. And he oh. moved to Nashville and started working at this record label and hmm. reached out to me about making an album. And it was another process of, even though they were pretty much doing all the work, mm -hmm. me dragging my feet and trying to figure out, you know, like, I don't think well, I'm alone I like I'm in this. I don't enough, think it's by the way. I'm not close enough. You, no, no, me. I, I was far away. You're close. I feel like am I am I better now? Um I it's not that I drag my feet because I'm lazy. It's that you know, you want you want to create a moment. You want it to be I, I don't believe in perfection, but you want to create a moment that feels special. And I was yes. like trying to find that and waiting and putting it off and uh, turning down certain opportunities because they didn't feel right. And then what had happened was the punchline in San Francisco had had me up to headline a few times. It's not the first time I had headlined, but it was the first time I had headlined an A club and done over an hour and really felt like impactful in doing so and um i was like this is the place and what transpired in the ensuing months was google bought the building they're in and they were at risk of being shut down and trying to find other locations but you know it's a historic club and i wanted it to be there so i that lit a fire under my ass to find the date to do it there before they close. And they, you know, managed to, Dave Chappelle went to City Hall and they got their lease extended for another, however long it was in Google, you know, like the, the evil overlords at the corporate headquarters had to like, be like, fine, we'll let these artists have their little uh, clubhouse for a little longer. And so, Last December, uh, well, for posterity purposes, December 2019, I was set to record there, um, headline on a Wednesday night, and then rec and record that, and then record my feature sets with Bobby Lee, um, 
the next night and they recorded wow. me when they recorded Adam Ray's album the previous year they rec- recorded my feature sets and some of the some like pieces of jokes are peppered in there to cover up you know like like blowing a line or whatever or or just mm-hmm. jokes that I get, that were out of rotation but to, but um on my drive up there my father-in-law yeah called me from his deathbed to say goodbye. So I'm glad I had those other recordings to, to draw from for some of the source material because I definitely, in the extensive process of listening back, listening back, listening back, listening back, I was just like, oh, I can definitely feel my sorrow and my pain and my distraction from being in the moment performing at the, in, in that particular show. Holy and, shit. um but but the second part of your question, I definitely used more of my bits that maybe fell out of rotation or that I was still doing that I probably had been doing for too long or brought back some that I hadn't done in years because I still think they're funny, but they maybe didn't apply to my life anymore. You know, I'm a pretty autobiographical comedian. So mm-hmm. I, I, I definitely drew, and I, in, in those shows, I did a wide range of material, old, new, but I, for the album, I just used stuff that was for the purposes of the arc of the album. So it's called Daddy Boy, mm-hmm. and it, it kind of just like the through line is like, I've come to LA to do comedy and and these are my uh, trials and tribulations. And then this is my maturation process and all the story of like how I got through it all with some social commentary and, and little one-liners all peppered in throughout. But you know, it's like basically how I'm a dad now, but very much still a child myself. I identify as a boy. I might be a man biologically, but I, identify it as a child uh, that's fair that's fair so that's i mean that that's all really interesting and i was going to say the first thing that you said or one of the first things was you know i was waiting for the right opportunity you have these expectations of in your head of what you want it to be so you might drag your feet i had just had that with my pops because he and i i wanted to have a father-son fishing trip with him this is not mm-hmm nearly as huge an accomplishment as creating a debut album but i wanted to do a fishing trip with him because he loves fishing i didn't know how to fish i wanted to be able to teach my son to do something because all i can Mm -hmm. offer right now is hey son let's do a father-son podcasting trip so (laughs) it's like let's let's try fishing so i i thought in my head i was like you know what i'll save up enough money we'll go to alaska we'll fish i don't know what you do like trident those salmon or whatever and we'll catch those and it'll be awesome we'll have some father-son moments where he'll say i love you we might have a hug i might get little tummy grumbles and it'll be great but it just never happened and then my wife finally in covid she was like why don't you take your dad on a fishing trip right here in arizona go x place and we ended up doing it and it was wonderful and so that's heartwarming (laughs) thank you oh I appreciate that. And, and it, you know what? What else is heartwarming is your comedy coming on to us. Ugh, that was a graphic dis- description. But <laughs> no, that's how it's been described. But I was just thinking about really quick before we, you, you talk about my comedy again, which I feel uncomfortable about, but I'm also totally into. Just like the idea of like you taking your kid on a podcasting trip and them being like, Dad, I thought you were going on a fishing trip. We were going on a fishing trip. No, son, I said um, podcasting. He's like, I thought you said casting. Like, <laughs> I thought we were going to be casting and catching fish and, you know, being out on the open water. Oh, son, I'm going to teach you tons of things. We're going to teach you how to do a plug. So I, I've got Squarespace here. I'm going to teach you how to plug in a mic, uh, teach you how to equalize. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe all the fish are going to die out in 20 years by the time I have a kid anyway. So podcasting might be more, more ubiquitous. According uh, to the doomsday environmentalists, they will be dead very soon. Fuck. So I wasted a trip with my dad. I should have just gone podcasting with him because what's the point now? I mean, 
Gone Caston. Gone Caston. Oh, that a bumper sticker with a little mic with the, the cord as if it was cast like a fishing rod. <laughs> exactly. All right. All right. Uh, but anyway, a podcasting no. trip is just a road trip where you and somebody else listen to podcasts the entire time. Oh God, Tr- a big old true crime binge. Uh, <laughs> fun. <laughs> but a- anyway, your your comedy coming on to all of us. I feel like it, I'm glad that you did it. It was an awesome album. I listened to a lot because I I have a lot of comedians on here, and I thought one. The first thing that stood out to me was the voice, obviously. Two, I, I thought that it was, like you had said, there was a little bit, or there was quite a bit about your life, autobiographical, how you grew up, you wanted to be a gynecologist. Maybe, I don't know if that part was true. <laughs> um, it is true, and my uncle is super flattered that I put that joke in there. <laughs> that was a, an amazing joke. And then, and then going in and going to LA, the side jobs that you ended up doing were you really a director of gay porn oh yeah you know i i believe you know every comic has a certain level of embellishment but mine is my margin is pretty little i would say it's like 10 to 25 percent but i absolutely i only really directed one scene but i shadowed a bunch and i was in that world and i was fully ready to like make that my part-time job and what it really came down to was my friend who owned the company Mm -hmm. was like look you're either gonna give up comedy and do this or I'm not gonna feel responsible when you're up for a big job and they find out that you direct gay porn and you lose it Mm. I have yet to be up for that big of a job where it would affect that but you know he was looking out for my best interests and I appreciate that. That's, that's really sweet. Really sweet. Well, I made for a good bit and Ooh, the, I, I will not spoil the line, the condition in which a, a straight man does gay porn directing, but thank you. that, that had me cracking up. I, I also wanted to laud you on how, and I felt like I didn't, I, I haven't felt this from comedians a lot in the way that you were doing it, but I felt like you had such a good control of the crowd where <clears throat> you did some crowd work throughout the sets, but I feel like you also were so engaging with them where instead of pointing a single person out, like a lot of comics do, and you did a little bit, you were also just straight up asking them questions, um, making angry proclamations at them for <laughs> laughing at jokes for people that you looked like, or that you said you looked like. And I, I feel like it seems like you really made it into like a big conversation between you and them. And that way you even said, don't heckle me unless you have good timing and you're waiting for, the t- but don't do it in the punchline and don't do it, but you can, but don't. So it really, it kind of kept them on their toes, I felt like. I would have been on my toes. Um, and, and I wanted to ask, how, how did you grow into that type of person that's just really in it with the crowd? Um, I like to try to cultivate the atmosphere, whether I'm headlining or featuring or opening or just doing a slot on a showcase show mm-hmm. where... I'm hanging out with the audience. Like we're in my basement of my parents' house because that's the genesis of, of my comedy is like at the Thanksgiving dinner table or in the, in my basement underage drinking, you know, like that's how I'm most comfortable and the most myself. Mm -hmm. And I also find that that allows for the best, feeling and response from the audience and it sets a good tone if I'm the opener or the feature for the rest of the show and that's just kind of who I am like I have enough awareness of myself that I know when people look at me I remind them of someone from their past someone from their dorm or someone they were that was like in their class that cracked jokes or you know a buddy that 
died from an OD or drunk driving, you know, like, um, I just, uh, I have, a, I, I was doing a show once a month in LA called Watch Me Chill. And basically I just like having the atmosphere where it's like, where it feels collaborative, even though it's very much not, but where right. people, it, it, it's like empowering the audience, I guess, to like have as much fun as they possibly can. I do think that, you know, I don't believe people should heckle. I don't believe people should like feel free reign, like when they are in the audience at a comedy show to, to feel entitled to do and say whatever they want. That's just not how it works. But I think right. that there's a certain feeling when you get into a comedy show for a lot of people in the audience, when they hear those announcements, like, turn your phones on silent, no heckling, no table talk, where it <clears throat> creates a tightness. Yeah. On top of the already, the already existent social situation of like, is this joke okay to laugh at? So I try to do my best to not only bring a certain kind of energy to empower them, but to like break down that tightness. That's amazing. And I will say the masterpiece of that in work was at the improv in Ontar Ontario oh, when you. I, holy shit, that, that I was floored and I didn't even see it from the other angle until today where I saw Bobby Lee had posted the other angle. But to sum it up, you were joking around with some people. You told a guy, I'd fuck you, which is a complete joke first off, like you would Obviously, say at the comedy yeah. club. And then also it's kind of a compliment. I mean, it's, right? I, I would be, I would gush if somebody said they would fuck me. So, uh, but the gentleman was not pleased and it looked like he took off his shirt and was ready to fight you, literally fight you. He, and he did. And it took a lot for me to not say, if you don't want to fuck, why are you taking your clothes off? Because it's like a very delicate dance of like being funny, but not escalating a hostile situation. Right. Oh God. That's amazing. I, you handled it so nicely that when I saw, I obviously knew that something was going on and that security, you could kind of see from the corner that they were taking care of it. And I think you could hear some of the yelling from the gentleman. I don't know why I'm calling him a gentleman. He's definitely not a gentleman, but you were just, and, and he got thrown on the table, but the crowd, for the most part, some of them were still looking at you and you were still providing commentary and making people laugh and they were totally on your side and you, you totally nailed that one. That was, God, amazing. Thank you. That's another anything. show where I was featuring for Bobby Lee. And the last thing you want to do as, I mean, as a feature, but in general is like derail a show. Right. Things will come up and I, and I have to like say from the previous question about like the atmosphere I like to create with the audience mm -hmm. and also dealing with any kind of curveball or variable from the audience. I've, I learned everything I know from, from working out at the comedy mm -hmm. store because when I first got there, the audiences were sparse and hostile and you never knew what you were getting yourself into. Yeah. And you would get heckled from the comics in the back of the room. Audience members would rush the stage on you. Um, there would just be all kinds of crazy shit going down there. So I learned my metal and how to keep calm by, by like really going through the ringer at the comedy store in those dark years. But Holy shit. Um, yeah, what man. It's, it's, it's a tough balance because there were things I wanted to say that I knew were funny, but in the moment, things kind of slowed down for me. And I was just like, okay, that's funny, but don't say that. It'll make it more antagonistic. And so I just had to like pick and choose what to say that would be funny, but not escalate the tension. So it's like, because if I'm too mean to, to people that do that, you're, you're going to lose most of the audience, even though those guys were clearly the aggressors and didn't right. know how to take a joke, but they were heckling all throughout the previous two comic sets. And oh. 
someone needed to put an end to it. And I didn't go up there. I mean, that was like 30 seconds into my set. And they, they went in with me. And I, you know, that's just what I do. It's fun. But you hope that that's not how most shows go. Um, my mom and my brother happened to be in the audience sitting right behind those guys. Oh, my God. Oh my God. And my mom, this is, this is um, pretty explanatory, if that's even a word, but this just kind of sets up who I am to my mom. At the end of the show, my mom came up to me. She's like, that was great how you had your friends pretend like they wanted to fight you. And I was like, <laughs> mom, those were real gang members. Those were not my friends and they want to kill me. And she's, that's just like what I've put her, her through throughout the years. It's like, oh, she thinks sure. that that is the, those are like the kind of antics that I would, I mean, it, it would be a brilliant bit if I had that set up to look like that and do that, but it was all just organic. Damn, damn. No, it was, it was crazy. My heart was pounding and I was just watching on a screen a year in the future so that was really <laughs> it was on my daughter's first birthday so there was a chance that that would be all that she got to experience of her daddy one year oh man i did i was gonna ask did they try to come after you at the end of the show or i'm sure there was security i was afraid something. of that and i stayed i stayed in the club for like an hour and a half after the show ended but they from what i was told from the uh, security footage, they got pulled over and arrested on their way out. Damn. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it's just something to think about for the rest of my life if they're going to track me down and find me. Oh, God. It's like Sideshow Bob going after Bart Simpson. All exactly. Exactly. Oh. I'll always have it hanging over my head. Man. Oh, well. I wish I had advice to give you for that one. This is an advice podcast, but. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, well, your special, amazing. I, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. People can listen to it on Pandora, Spotify, Apple Music, pretty much everywhere. Everywhere. Even apps I've never even heard of. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well. That's awesome. Is there, I was going to ask, before we get into the advice, it's been a pleasure speaking with you so far, Sandy, but I was going to ask, what else have you got going on? What would you like to plug? Where can people find you? I managed to conveniently mention all the things uh, at the beginning. You did. Um, movie called Tar. You can find it on demand through Apple, um, Apple Movies or iTunes, whatever they're calling it these days, or Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a horror comedy. It's a right? horror comedy. Yeah, I'm the comic relief in it. I'm very funny in it. Um, <laughs> and uh, Jewish Life TV, a show called The Word, which, you know, I'm not particularly religious, but it is just fun to discuss and make fun of um, passages from the Bible. And that's kind of what we do. And I think they're, they're looking, they're looking, that channel is looking to like expand into a younger, hipper audience. And so this is their um, attempt at doing so. And it's actually like a really fun show to do. And I think that the um, product is, is good. It's something that, that um, I think if you happen to come upon, I don't know who on earth gets Jewish Life TV at their homes. But if you happen to come upon it, it's, it's something that you, like whether you're religious or not, you could find enjoyable just because like who doesn't have like a rudimentary knowledge of the Bible. And that's all I really have. And um, that's what we're talking about and making fun of. So, and then it devolves into other funny riffs. And then um, my album, Daddy Boy, Find It Anywhere. My podcast, MFers, a parenting podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, my Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter are all the same, at Sandy Danto. And I'm in a new Shutterfly commercial you'll probably come across because I get like 
five texts a day from people I haven't talked to in years that say they <laughs> saw me on it. And um, I'm in the Comedy Store documentary on Showtime. Nice. You know, I do things. I'm in stuff. I, I you, make the rounds. Yeah, yeah, you spread more easy than Corona because you're in <laughs> a lot. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But I, 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 I've seen you in a bunch of stuff. My favorite is you being the uh, Microsoft start bar. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty obscure one. Yeah. <laughs> That was a fun commercial to do from the producers of Tar, actually. Really? Yeah, oh. Cronyism at its best. It's all, <laughs> it's all connected. That's amazing. All right. Well, Sandy, so excited to get into some advice with you. So we're going to answer a couple questions. Before cool. we do, um, I've got an inspirational quote that'll help get us all inspired so that okay, we can cool. uh, answer these questions. Before we get into that, I'd like to ask my guests if they have any inspirational quotes that can help get them through their dark days. Do you have any in your back pocket? The only one that comes to mind off the top of my head is from my album, The Best Time to Stab Someone Is at a Halloween Party. <laughs> that is inspirational for murderers. I like that. You want to know what? I, I honestly, I, I'm not a huge fan of inspirational quotes just because I think they are bastardized by social media. But my favorite inspirational quotes are the ones that are basically telling you, like, don't try so hard. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. Don't worry. Hmm. Like, People that this is a list of people who didn't become successful till they were 40, you know, the kind of yeah. things that, that give you a sense of relief instead of like work hard every day and you'll sow the fruits of your labor, you know, like, yeah, I think yeah. inspirational quotes get the same ones get so overused that they're meaningless, but I really love the ones that are like, you know, go easy on yourself and you'll find that if you don't work so hard, things will just happen naturally. Uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but stuff the, like that. The gentle ones, the ones yes. that are, yes, I love it. By the way, ever since you talked about the, um, what was it, the word and saying you weren't that religious of a person, you're not, mm -hmm. the, you're, I'm not seeing the top of your head and I just see the curls right here. And... <laughs> <laughs> and so that's I, I keep seeing it and it gives me inspiration <laughs> uh, beautiful <laughs> beautiful all right well thank you for that inspirational quote sandy i've got one it's actually not by a person at all it's by a robot and it's called inspirobot and what it does is it uses ai to take some of the wisest words known to man and then just mush them together for a really juicy inspirational quote. Okay, we'll try okay. and see if it means anything to us, but I'll read it. It says, <clears throat> Inspirobot says, failing at remembering is probably a result of having a bad brain. Inspiring. Hmm. All Don't right. have such a bad brain. <laughs> i thought i thought it was just like you know what don't worry about it you just got a bad brain you're not gonna remember nothing things. you can do about that yeah so carry on all right well thank you inspirebot that was inspiring we'll move on to the questions we've got this first one it's found by our fan heather it says my boyfriend hates his birthday so today is my boyfriend's birthday he really hates it I need some help deciding on what to do, what to say, what not to say, etc. Obviously, I know not to throw a surprise party or anything else extravagant, but I'm even wondering if I should say happy birthday. Can anyone relate to him? If so, any advice? All right. Um, yes, a piece of advice. People who hate their birthday are lying. We <laughs> all hate our birthday. Who wants to get a fucking year older, but who at the same time hates cake, a nice dinner, gifts, attention. Like we all like that. We don't like adding numbers to our age, but the, the, the moral of the story is don't make a big deal about it. Just good food, 
and a thoughtful gift. And then it, it, look, my birthday is the day after Christmas. So I get the notion of not liking your birthday. It's, mm. it's come around for me where it's like the best birthday because I don't have to deal with all the like pressure of like, am I going to have a party? Mm. And, uh, but you know, for a long time I was like, oh, no one has ever acknowledged my birthday for most of my life. And now I love that. But like people that say, I hate my birthday. It's like somebody hurt you. That's why. That's and <clears throat> you just have to be cognizant of, of the sensitivity that somebody has of, of like having had maybe a few birth. I mean, if today is the birthday, it's on veterans day. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know, oh. but it's just about like making that person as comfortable as they can without making a, a big, a lot of fanfare over it. That's right. I totally agree with that. I think Sandy, you, you hit it on the head. If they don't, if they say they don't like their birthday, they were hurt at some point. And maybe they were hurt because somebody forgot it was their birthday. Didn't give them the love that they deserve. They didn't give them that tummy grumble feeling. So mm -hmm. I, I think what you should do, like you said, give them those little treats, give them that love and attention, maybe some cake, maybe some present, something that's just, it's not in your face happy birthday like i'm gonna make you like it but more of like uh just the tip of the birthday hey, experience here's your favorite meal and your favorite dessert you want a candle i got that you don't we don't need to use it we don't need to light it yeah that's fine we don't need to just light it but you can put it inside of me if you want or i you whatever you're into it's your birthday but we don't have to acknowledge that yeah, yeah. One candle for each year in each hole. That's, <laughs> that <we're... laughs> oh, God. Oh, man. It, it. Would be, it'd be like birthday voodoo almost. Just, uh, ah, all right. Yeah. Okay. So you could do that. I was thinking, too, you could maybe, if they don't like their birthday, you could do a little nice thing. And then you could, you could give them all the treats. You could really spoil them the day after their birthday and be like, it's not your birthday. And then you make them feel really yeah. special and be like, I really like you. And I know you hate your birthday, but this is not your birthday. And I'm going to treat you. I'm going to treat you self, you. You surprise so, them on a, di a random day of the year. And you're like, surprise, it's not your birthday, but I'm going to do all the things that people do for birthdays. Cause you don't hate do this day. You just hate the day that your mom, who was too rough on you as a kid and you have issues about it, gave birth to you, and that's why you hate your birthday. <laughs> that's really, I think we came up with something really cute because then I do too. you're going to be very rom com y. Oh my God. Should we pitch this somewhere? Is this? I think so. I think so. Birthday, birth date, birth date, because they're boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on. Sandy, I was going to say, you have to pick up your daughter. Do, are you okay on time for one more question? Or Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. We've got one more question. This is from our fan, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. It says, is this horror movie creepy or a nice gesture? So I have a very small home business where I make soap and other bath products. I'm always... So I've always got a good hundred or so bars of soap in various styles and scents. While doing some jogging around my apartment complex, I've seen some signs on lawns with class photos and like a proud graduate of X lives here. I feel bad for graduates since they didn't get an actual senior year. I thought it might be a nice gesture to wrap up some soap and either leave it at the door with a note or just set it down, knock, walk back and explain what it's for. But as I thought about it, I realized that I'm a random 30-year-old dude, and this could be considered very creepy, considering our only connection is we're neighbors in the same general complex. I still want to do something nice. What do I do? Whew, a long one. So we can yeah. let that ruminate. But Sandy, what, what do you think about this gift-giving idea? Hmm. I think 
there's this weird part of the human condition where we all love free stuff and we all love to get stuff. But in actuality, gifts can be a burden. Mm -hmm. We've all gotten the gift that is simply an errand. And then it becomes burdensome because then, depending on how close you are with the person or what that gift builds your relationship to or, you know, you don't want to be found out as having returned a gift you don't know if the person giving it is going to feel slighted by that also one time a couple of friends came over for dinner and they Uh, got us a housewarming gift of a french press and my mom always taught me to just say thank you uh uh-huh but we already had a french press but she said because at a birthday party when i was little somebody got me something that i already had and i said i already have that and my mom said Somebody gets you a gift, just say thank you. And so I just said thank you. And then I wish I wish you would have said, I already have that, just like that. And well, then we had dinner <laughs> and my friends were like, Hey, do you already have a French press? And I was like, Yeah, but like I, I'm still grateful that you guys got us one. <laughs> like it was very awkward. So gifts can be awkward and burdensome and i think that um you know you really got to know it's either got to be something baseline that anyone can use like a gift card or a candle or like a nice like a really nice enjoyable hand soap or like a mint plant yeah i i agree go ahead or like um you know, just refrain and um, smile and um, strike up a conversation. Unless you, you know, you could go the creepy route and find out about them and find out what they need and what they love. And that's also a slippery slope because getting found out doing that is potentially weird, but- um, Very, you know. yes. Or like high school, looking up high school students' interests and hobbies. If you're a 30 year old man. And then I think you're absolutely right. You don't want to burden them. You don't want to French presser anybody and give them the burden of accepting the gift. So I would say also you have hundreds of these soaps and bath products are, is it because you're not selling them? Is it because your baths, uh, your bath products and soaps suck and do like weird odors? Do you, do you have these strange concoctions and you name them odors after occasions? Like, I hate my birthday or uh, mama didn't love me. And then you're going to try to pawn those off on other people. This sounds a little like you're trying to give free samples. Right. You're trying to market yourself. Yeah. Or, you know, it could be taken as like, so what are you saying? That I smell bad? That I don't have good hygiene? Right, right. Oh, stinky seniors. Congrats, you graduated. Now wash off that senior stank and get out of our neighborhood. That's the message that I would get. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, so, you know, if it's, if it's like, all right, I'll say this. The best, the best, bar none, housewarming gift you can get a person. And I'm not being paid by them to say this is Aesop hand soap. By the way, while we're coming up with ideas, Sandy, mm-hmm. if we ever create a soap, we should call it bar none. <laughs> Just, <laughs> sorry. But anyway, it, it was called what? I, t- I was so concentrated on Aesop that. hand soap. It's, it's expensive. Okay. But it's delightful. It makes you want to wash your hands even though you don't need to. Okay. And I'm saying no oh. one no one wants bars of soap anyway. Like who who uses bar, like it, that's a very personal thing. You can't like share bars of soap with other people. You're not supposed to. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean you shouldn't. So I mean, I don't know if it's like somebody going off to college, but who the fuck is going off to college during a pandemic, you know? Right, right. And then he's going to pack a bar of soap with them. 
I think you just got to ask yourself, am I doing this for me or am I doing it for the good of somebody else? And whatever right. answer you come to with that, just know that that's why you're doing it. And um, be cool with that and, and own it. Yeah. Take and one of know that it's not necessarily a gift for them. It's a gift for both of you. There you go. Take one of your bars of soap and come clean about your intentions. <laughs> oh, no, no, God. Nope. <laughs> ne never mind. Let me take that one back. Well, uh, I feel like we have blown our advice loads and we're all empty and we're ready to top off this podcast. So Sandy, first off, thank you so much for joining. It was a pleasure to meet you. It was a pleasure to talk Likewise, with you about your man. special. And um, if you are ever in Phoenix, I would love to see you perform. I, you know, before all this would go to Phoenix like three, four times a year, Tempe Improv, Stand Up Live, et cetera, et cetera. Oh man. But um, I'm looking forward to getting back there. I actually love it there. It's uh, the crowds are always great. And um, Phoenix is a cool town, man. Phoenix it, is cool. I like the desert. I'm a desert boy. Oh, same Z's. I, I love it here. I was on the East Coast for about eight years in New Jersey, New York, and coming back here, God, the weather. Ah, and then the beautiful cacti, just the wonderful aesthetic. Lovely. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway it was a pleasure to have you one more time for the audience just in case they didn't catch the first time what have you got to plug where can people find you most importantly just check out daddy boy google daddy boy sandy danto you'll find how to listen to my album and check out my social media at sandy danto and my podcast mfers a parenting podcast that's and right that's that's pretty much, you know, all the rest will fall into place. That's right. And we'll have a link to all of that in the show notes. MFers, great podcast. I was thank listening you, to it a little bit today. And Stefan, thank, thank you for taking an interest in me. This was really lovely. I enjoyed talking to you. And I would love to come back and do this again. You're welcome anytime. I'd love to have you back on. If you reach under your seat, you'll find a bar of soap specifically <laughs> you son of a bitch <laughs> you got soaped <laughs> <laughs> fuck uh well thank you Dan. i'm bar um, done <laughs> little dad joke for, for the oh, people God. out there listening and who says we don't do clean comedy over here uh... <laughs> <laughs> that was a double pun <laughs> Uh, well, and that's it, man. It, it was a pleasure. I'd love to have you on again sometime. And it was awesome to meet you. Likewise, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank Take you. care. All right. Bye-bye.